Hello and good afternoon and welcome to the first Kashmir Palestine uh, for the first online, uh, fully online Kashmir Palestine scholars and network session. And um, I hope we have uh, everyone in the audience here and that you can hear me well. Please let me know in the chat if you cannot hear me. Uh, so my name is Emma Brendlund. I am one of the co-organizers of the Kashmir Palestine Scholars Network, together with my colleague Tufik Haddad, who is here as well. And uh, the Kashmir Palestine Scholars Network uh, is funded by the British Academy of Knowledge Seed Grant. And, um, and it's uh, with the purpose of setting up a scholarly network for scholars working in Kashmir and Palestine, respectively, to initiate conversations, dialogue, and scholarly exchanges, as well as scholarly activism um, on Kashmir and Palestine. Uh, so this is, uh, we launched our event in uh, East Jerusalem uh, almost a month ago. Um, with an excellent keynote speech by a colleague, um, Professor Goldie Osuri, uh, as well as screening the film, uh, Bring Him Back um, by Fahad Shah. We had amazing speakers. And today we are excited to have our first real online conversation seminar uh, on uh, economic dimensions that Tufik will talk a little bit more about uh, in a bit. Um, so, the, yeah, so the, the purpose, of this conversation seminar is to, uh, to, have, to have opportunities for scholars to have dialogue of, about their academic, academic expertise. Um, so this week we are looking at economic dimensions. On the 13th of December, we have a session on popular resistance uh, and on 18th of January on culture, poetry, and literature. And so before I hand over to uh, to, to FIC to introduce the specific session in more detail, I would also like to um, uh, raise the attention to the situation of Koran Parvez, who is an internationally acclaimed human rights defender from Kashmir. Uh, he is the co-founder of the and, organ and the program coordinator for the Jammu and Kashmir Coalition of Civil Society, and he has uh, and he is an internationally renowned human rights activist. He has been uh, um, He's been in illegally detained um, since uh, since earlier on this year, and today is um, today the free Kashmir uh, sorry the free Koran Parvez campaign is um, is organizing an online appeal to to raise attention to um, to bring attention to Koran situation, um, so he um, um, there is. As we've talked about in this today and in our events, there's an ongoing human rights crisis in Indian Kashmir, and Kuram is one of the most well-known Kashmiri human rights uh, activists. And uh, so we would like to, you to join us in the demanding the immediate and unconditional release of Kuram Parvez. Uh, you can do this by joining the Twitter campaign, hashtag, hashtag free Kuram, join on Facebook, Twitter, and, um, and online. And, um, and I believe there's going to be a kind of, a, what's it called, a thunderclap or an, a joint uh, tweet at 4.30 UK time. So as soon as this event is over, actually, we you know, encourage you all to go on to, go on to Twitter and, and tweet the hashtag free Kuram. And so thank you for that. And I would like to hand over now to uh, my colleague Tufik. Great, Emma. Thank you for that. I think uh, maybe what we'll do is we'll put information on that campaign on the in the chat uh, menu uh, so that, hang on, there is a chat menu here, right? Excuse us. Yes, there is. So put that, I think we'll put that information up there so that uh, we can hopefully make sure that the uh, the campaign can be as effective as possible, at least at this stage of it. Uh, my name is Tofik Haddad. Uh, you know, I'm one of the uh, together with Emma, Dr. Emma Brandlund, uh, basically ha have attempted to try and put, pull together this Kashmir Palestine Scholars Solidarity Network. Uh, and this is the second that's uh, of the conversation series, but the first that we fully do online. Uh, we're very pleased. I, I have a personal 
interest myself in uh, economics and political economy and, and development studies. And we've put together a very interesting panel of different folks today. Uh, again, the purpose of these conversation series is to sort of familiarize each other with uh, different scholarly communities with the, uh, the different facets of the situation in both of these uh, areas, uh, but also not to do it in a sort of one that just feigns uh, objectivity, but also we are, you know, we clearly have interests in making sure that uh, academic debate and freedom of speech and uh, <laughs> right to self-determination are all part of the politics of, of, of what we're doing. Uh, so we are activist scholars and we're proud of that. Uh, so with that said, uh, today we have uh, an interesting lineup of folks uh, who will be speaking with us. Uh, we're gonna start off with Dr. Mahrush Tuck, who is a lecturer in agribusiness at the Royal Veterinary uh, Veterinarian uh, College. Uh, she is an applied economist researcher researching agricultural policies and food systems in low and middle east middle income countries. And much of her work evaluates nutrition sensitivity of programs and policies using approaches from development economics, including microeconometrics and mixed methods. She also regularly provides monitoring and evaluation expertise on food systems and nutrition financing to international donors. Uh, I also will mention that she is a research fellow at the Council for British Research in Levant and is trying to make her way to Jerusalem but is encountering some visa issues. I hope I'm not saying too much or too little here, <laughs> but hopefully we'll be receiving her in Jerusalem soon enough. Uh, her counterpart who will be speaking initially on the Palestinian side is Dr. Subhi Samour. Uh, Dr. Samour is a visiting assistant professor at Quds University Bard College for Arts and Sciences in Jerusalem. He chairs the economics and finance program as well as the newly launched social thought economy and policy program. In 2017, he was also the Ibrahim Abu Lughat Fellow and postdoctoral research scholar at the Center for Palestine Studies at Columbia University, where he worked on comparative ec political economy, uh, comparative political economy of indigenous labor under settler colonialism. He's published on trade union policy, li Palestinian labor in Israel, the Palestinian Authority's new liberal economic policy reforms, amongst others, and has acted as a consultant and researcher for UNCTAD, uh, UNDP, and others. Uh, the initial lineup was going to feature just Mehrush and uh, Subhe, and that's not uh, saying that lightly. Both of them are heavyweights in their own discipline. We don't want to uh, take away from, from them in any sense. But uh, then we, at a certain stage in this process, we became uh, aware of uh, Abdullah Muaswis, who uh, is a Palestine scholar working at. He's a doctoral student at the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies at the University of Exeter, and who's engaged in his own PhD research scholarship on Palestine and Kashmir from a political economy and ecology of colonial occupation perspective. So given the fact that we want to be as inclusive as possible, as well as to generate this, uh, conversations that are as vibrant as possible, uh, we have tapped uh, uh, Abdullah to uh, be chairing this event, at least overseeing uh, the discussions that will be coming from Mehrush and Subhi, giving his own responses to that, and then engaging them both with questions. Uh, and I will help him out also at the end when and if we get to the stage, when we get to the stage of taking questions from the audience. So all you folks out there, please, uh, you know, keep a notepad next to you and be ready for uh, you know to write down those questions and please put them in the question and answer feature. I'll be going through them and uh, passing them on to Abdullah so that the, your questions get to both of our speakers and we hear those responses. So without further ado, I'm just going to hand over to Abdullah. Abdullah, you hear me? Yes, I do. Thank you so much. Excellent. So Abdullah, please take it away in your own fashion and uh, I'll, I'll be around in the background if anybody needs me, and we'll be back later on, both Emma and myself. Go ahead, Abdullah. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you to uh, Tofi and to Emma for organizing this event, and of course to Mehrush and Subhi for being uh, our our panelists for today. I'm honored to be chairing um, this conversation. It's you know one that I've been wanting to see for a very long time, and so. Um, just kind of to give a brief introduction, of course, Palestine and Kashmir, you know, have always been kind of like related to a certain degree. You know, they've both kind of come out of Britain's attempts to restructure its empire in the 1940s, both involved military occupations and a decades long 
suppression of aspirations and movements for national liberation. So some scholars, of course, would suggest that Palestine and Kashmir were linked from the very beginning through India's foreign policy, you know, where Indian support for Palestine was in part, you know, a strategic aspect of isolating the Kashmiri cause from other uh, Muslim ruled countries. And these connections, of course, have since then intensified uh, in, 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 a, in a very quick way, particularly in the last three decades and even more so in the last decade. Um, so the last event, um, you know, the previous conversation did a really great job of, of, of kind of pointing out some of these connections, as did the opening keynote from Goldie Usuri about a month ago. And uh, today's conversation is particularly relevant in light of the extension of the Indo-Israel Agriculture Project to Kashmir, where two centers of excellence, so-called, are due to be established in Jammu and Kashmir. Agriculture and ecology, of course, as our speakers will likely uh, discuss was a critical means through which you know the dispossession of Palestinians was 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 you know enforced uh, in terms of their lands, resources, water, um, and livelihoods, um, and one of the ways in which local economies were then restructured. And so, in that sense, I'm delighted to um, introduce both of our speakers, each of whom will speak for roughly around 15 minutes. After which, uh, we will have a conversation and then open up for a Q and A, as Tofi said. So, uh, um, of course, I don't want to delay anymore. So please, um, Mehrush, you have uh, 15 minutes. I will uh, I'll give you a signal when, when you have a minute remaining. Perfect, one moment. I think you can see me now. Can you see my screen also? Mandatory question asking before we I start. Can, I can see it, yes. Perfect, uh, thank you. If our participants can also see it, just, you know, kind of, if you cannot see it, say something in the chat, but I think everybody should be able to see it. Perfect. Thanks very much, Abdullah. Um, first of all, before I start, um, thank you very much for CBRL, in particular Tofik and obviously Emma, to organize this series. As Abdullah said, it's been um, in it's been long time coming and finally we're here and we're, I'm looking forward to the discussions we have today and to learn uh, from my Palestinian counterpart um, today. Um, my uh, presentation today will briefly cover how the Indian policies in Kashmir have de-developed or mal-developed, as I say, in my presentation um, today. And in particular, I'll pay attention to the 2019 re-annexation of Jammu and Kashmir, and I'll um, start with describing um, um, what, what happened in 2019. Just to provide a brief context of where we are, this is um, the region of Jammu and Kashmir, including uh, various different uh, parts of it, which are now between divided between three nation states, Pakistan, which has the northern areas, and Azad Jammu Kashmir, which is called the Free Jammu Kashmir, uh, Aksai Chin, which is under uh, Chinese control at the moment, and the orange part over here, which is under uh, Indian control. However, the Indian map official map always shows the whole region as part of its um, territory. So what happened in 2009, August 2019 is um, Indian government removed something called the Article 370, which was part of its constitution, which provided uh, Jammu and Kashmir special rights and special um, and autonomy um, uh, in re relation to not being governed fully by India. So re annexed uh, Jammu and Kashmir, which was previously annexed in 1948 already, and divided the region, which is under Indian administration. So this is the colored um, as part of the map, is under Indian administration, not, not this bit of um, Akshay Chin, which is under Chinese control, but all of this bit is under Indian administration, and it divided that, um, uh, removed the statehood, which is what the provinces in India are called, and split them into split them into two. So this part is Jammu and Kashmir, and this part is Ladakh now. Um, and the motivation behind the annexation of the region was that Jammu and Kashmir was uh, lagging behind in development according to the Indian states. Um, however, um, underestimated <laughs> calculations suggest that just in the first like four or five months of uh, the annex, uh, re annexation, Two and a half or 2.4 billion worth of US dollars were uh, lost in terms of um, economic activity um, just in Kashmir. So, this is not for the whole region, but rather um, uh, just about lost that much um, economic value in this first five months of the mm -hmm. abrogations. Um, so, today, what I want to do in this presentation in the next like, 
30, 40 minutes is to demystify this notion of uh, lagging behind and what um, underdevelopment of JNK really means. Um, then second, I want to identify some uh, economic development policies of the Indian state uh, that have been practiced in uh, Jammu and Kashmir that lead to uh, de-development or maldevelopment. And then I want to unpack some of the more uh, immediate um, impact of the re-annexation and its implications on economic and economic welfare um, for the people of Jammu and Kashmir. And finally, um, through this presentation, what I will do is try to argue that the re-annexation of Jammu and Kashmir is an exercise in resource extraction that restricts the local population's access to economic human rights through the use of techno-economic language that masks Indian government's uh, political goals as uh, economic ones. I can't speak slowly. Sorry, I'm just trying to cover as much as possible, but let me slow down from here on. Right, so um, what I want to do is contextualize um, the welfare and development indicators in, in the re of the region. So the blue um, bars that you see are the na Indian national average and the green bars that you will see is um, data on Jammu and Kashmir itself. And as you can see, com in comparison to the Indian national average, poverty in Jammu and Kashmir is way lower than the Indian national average. So the Indian national average of poverty in the latest round of um, data that they collected was about 22-23% poverty in, uh, in, in India, whilst in Jammu and Kashmir it was around 10%, which has actually even increased from the uh, from uh, mid-2000s. Um, later, but yeah. Um, the other indicator which is useful to look at is the life expectancy itself, and like life expectancy in Jammu and Kashmir is much higher, around 72 years age, 72, 73 years, uh, whilst in India is around 68. So there's a huge about four years um, um, you know, difference between the life expectancy, and there are many other human development indicators like this. Um, that in which uh, Jammu and Kashmir performs much better than the international average. Um, so what has been, so the, with that, I just want to say that there was no lagging behind in terms of development in the region, but what perhaps could be then the motivation of the Indian state to abrogate um, or re-annex uh, Jammu and Kashmir again. Um, and to, to answer that question, what, we, what I will do is, first of all, explain perhaps what the role of state, and by state I mean the Indian state, um, is in the economic maldevelopment of the region. So the first thing was that the state in itself um, played uh, a social transformation role, which is the Jammu and Kashmir state, not the Indian state, played a uh, social transformation role. Um, Article 370, which um, allowed special status to the region, provided economic protection to the local economy, which is a low investment economy due to uncertainty and conflict, like long-term nature of uncertainty and conflict in the region. So three decades of militarization and armed conflict meant that there was uncertainty, economic uncertainty in the region, which has, uh, which um, uh, meant that economic growth was not that high, but uh, other development indicators, and some, I will allude to why that may be, were, were still okay and doing better than international coverage. So this Article 370, what it did was provided uh, economic uh, protection uh, to the key re uh, uh, sectors, economic sectors of the region, one of which is uh, tourism that um, only uh, what we used to call and we still call is state subjects and subjects of the region were able to, or citizens of the region were able to invest in the economy and own land in the economy, but non-Kashmiri, non-people who are not from Jammu and Kashmir or Ladakh could not own land in the region, which provided some level of like um, protection from the Indian uh, investment and Indian uh, uh, states uh, policies. And so in that sense, the, the, what the government of Jammu and Kashmir was playing a de facto partial social transformation role in the region, um, where it did not ever want to fulfill this role of transition to capitalism completely, but it did provide some pre-capitalist and pre-industrial um, uh, policies and mechanisms uh, that allowed the region to continue to live the way it was doing. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip this. Um, when, and then when the, the Article 370 was removed, that economic protection was also removed with it. Um, the second thing, um, that Article 370 provided Jammu and Kashmir was financial autonomy. We had something, we still have, but it's not in the same sense, 
um, something called uh, Jammu and Kashmir Bank, which was de facto central bank of the region. So once India has or other countries may have their own central banks, mm -hmm. Jammu and Kashmir Bank de facto played that role of central bank of the region. It did not print its own money. We still use Indian currency, but it had it supported a lot of financial um, uh, policies that allowed smallholders specifically, but also small businesses and large businesses to continue doing what they were doing and run their economy whilst uncertain uncertain economic status continued. And in 2011, what Indian government did is that removed that central bank uh, bank status uh, in order to. Um, gain more con financial control over the region. And finally, in 2016, it um, it um, applied what is called the Securitization Reconstruction of Financial um, Assets and Enforcement of Security Interest Act uh, to Jammu and Kashmir. This, was, this act was previously implemented in India in 2002, but could not be implemented in Kashmir because of um, Article 370 that gave the region special status. So in 2016, they enforced that upon uh, the region in order to take control of non -Kash of Kashmiri land assets um, or financial assets, with, um, which were not previously allowed to, to happen. And with the 2019 abrogation now, um, in non-Kashmiri, non non-state uh, subject uh, people can actually buy off these assets and in distress um, from Kashmiri and local uh, businessmen and business people. So um, it, uh, this is a critical part of how the region's economy actually worked and how that financial autonomy has been taken away by the Indian state. And as recent as to um, last year, last September, the Jammu and Kashmir uh, Bank was primarily owned by the Jammu and Kashmir government, but because the government was taken over by the Indian state, which meant that the, uh, the bank lost further autonomy that was taken away from it in 2016 already. And now in particular, um, uh, the, de facto the de facto manager of JK Bank is the Lieutenant Governor of Jammu and Kashmir, which basically is the, the, uh, the head who runs um, Jammu and Kashmir uh, from the Indian central government. Sorry, I'm, I'm sure there are many words that I'm using that may not be that obviously understandable. So please do um, uh, ask me clarifying questions in, in the discussion. Um, okay, so so the third way the state um, de-developed or maldeveloped the region was through comparative disadvantage. Um, the critical thing in Jammu and Kashmir was that uh, local markets were flooded by Indian goods quite often and um, from uh, other parts of the region, rather than any kind of investment being given to local economy to develop their own um, um, economic assets. So, for example, we have a huge um, livestock um, uh, population, specifically in terms of cattle. Uh, and instead of developing the, that value chain, the Indian uh, investors used to come in to take away um, uh, dairy products and then sell it back uh, to the region. And same happens with, uh, with uh, a lot of like the Apple value chain too. Um, the handicraft sector is a, a very um, good example of how, the re the, how um, even though we have a huge artisanal economy, uh, was dismantled uh, by um, labor, by extracting the knowledge from the region and also um, uh, replacing labor um, um, in, in this uh, sector. Um, and finally, the, the, the state government by that, um, also the Indian government did never really provide any economic incentives to promote these, uh, to promote the local economy. Uh, because the Indian state always wanted to make Jammu and Kashmir rely on um, um, the Indian uh, um, Indian state. Um, the fourth point, and this is, I think, perhaps like the most uh, interesting one to make today, given um, uh, Abdullah's presence here, is the resource extraction that happened uh, and continues to happen in the region. Um, oh, one second. Um, so the resource extraction ha happens in 
two different ways of, uh, and this is how I conceptualize it. One is like there's an economic hegemony over the local population, but the other is also through resource extraction, the Indian state wants to have a cult, also wants to have culture hegemony on, over the local population. And I'll provide some examples of how they, they do that. The first is uh, the example of uh, the National Hydropower Project. So um, three of the five Indian rivers pass through Jammu and Kashmir. Um, and that is a quite critical uh, part of like why the strategic um, um, advantage of being in Jammu and Kashmir for India. And uh, part of their um, 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 policy in the region is to develop these hydropower projects. And, something that has been existing since the late 90s. Um, and often people call it the new East India Company also because of how they extract resources from the region. So about 33% of all hydroelectric capacity in India is produced in Kashmir. But of this 33%, 67 is exported to India, 13 we can avail for free for by ourselves. And for 20%, we have to uh, pay the Indian state to be able to buy and utilize the electricity that is produced in our on our land, um, which is a form of resource extraction and of and multiple state governments before the abrogation for the reannexation happened in 2019 tried to negotiate with the Indian state before BJP when Congress was also uh, was running the the country to try to negotiate a, a power sharing mechanism of hydroelectricity, how hydropower uh, projects, in which case the, in, the Kashmiri population would have some kind of ownership or state would have some ownership over the, uh, the infrastructure projects, but multiple requests were denied by the Indian government. Um, okay, I've already spoken about this. Um, and then the other form of resource extraction that happens in the region is through religious tourism. So 86% of people who visited Kashmir between 2012 and 2017 um, actually visited for two religious uh, uh, two religious uh, pilgrimage o pilgrimages only. So that just shows that how uh, critical um, the religious tourism sector is for Indian government's um, uh, presentation in the in, uh, in the region. Um, what these religious tourism projects have done is they've over-concretized the fragile ecosystems in which these pilgrimages are based. And there's been a, some estimates suggest that 10% of forest cover has been lost to, uh, to tourism in the region. And further that about 24% um, of cumulative deglacialization has happened in many uh, glaciers that are, are relevant to religious sites. So this uh, Kolahai glacier that I'm, I'm talking about here is the base of, um, is where the Amarnath Yatra is, which is quite critical for the Indian presence in the in Jammu and Kashmir. Um, so there is just the oversubscription of the religious and pilgrimage routes in the region, where once upon a time where these yatras used to account for about 4,000 people in 1963, now they account, account for uh, 260,000 people in 2017, and much more so in the recent years. Um, these uh, the, the pilgrims that go to Amaranath or to Vaishnav Devi are often um, subsidized and paid for by the Indian state. Uh, and any infrastructure development around tourism is usually uh, targeted towards Indian population, uh, making making it easy for Indian population population to visit the region for religious purposes. And this is their Indian state's way of normalizing um, the that the region is actually Hindu rather than Muslim majority. Right. Um, I am so so. Very briefly, I don't know how many minutes I have left. Um, you, you, are, you are over at this point, but I know that this okay. was the point and I wanted you to finish it. Okay, brilliant. So I'm going to quickly and skip this one if I can come back to this and just make my conclusion if that's okay. Yeah, yeah go for it. Perfect, thank you. Um, so just to conclude over here, um, I want to say that how there has basically been this myth of underdevelopment in the region and that the re-annexation of Jammu and Kashmir in 2019 actually uh, was not motivated by economic means, but rather by political means. And therefore the use of techno-economic techno language by the Indian state um, cannot justify what is um, their, their 
um, policies in, in the region. Um, and I will stop here so we can uh, focus more on questions rather than my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mehrush. That was incredibly informative. And I'm, I'm really pleased with all the, the details and the data that was in there. I'm blown away, honestly. Um, now, switching gears a little bit, if I can invite uh, Subhi to, to, to give his presentation. Is Subhi still in here? You know, uh, this is Tofiq coming from the netherworld. <laughs> but uh, just in the run up to this, uh, Subhi mentioned that he had, was it an internet out or an electricity out? Uh, electricity, so the power out. Yes. Uh, so it seems he's not online right now. We'll try and get to him. Um, I kind of wonder. Let me see if I can find him. If you have any particular question you want to ask Mehrush, or actually if you want to have some extra time, Mehrush, to say some final things, because I, I think your conclusion might have been a bit undone. I would be really happy for Mehrush to go over the accumulation by disposition stuff that, uh, that right. we're at the end. Of course, I can do that. Let me just bring my slides up again. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, Mehrush, I couldn't see that you couldn't see the chat, so I had written for you the one minute in there. Oh. But no worries at all so, and i mean i don't have much more to say i'll say a little bit but then abdullah once i finished you can i'm happy for you to maybe um, once we wait with subi That's to fine. give your reflections so very yeah. um i mean I, there were, as i said I, I didn't have much to say here because there's a whole paper and this just these this this slide itself um, but what we are um, observing at the moment is, unfortunately, um, the classic case of accumulation by dispossession through the creation of uh, land banks and eviction of um, indigenous communities from their land in, in Jammu and Kashmir. Um, so I, I have put these two things, and there are multiple ways through, through which uh, okay, the dispossession is is happening in the region. But these two things were quite stark because the way the abrogation or re-annexation was presented to the Indian population very much and to the world was that uh, development was going to come to the region and the way to do that was to create a bank, land bank across the region that could be sold off to non-Kashmiri international um, uh, investors. Um, fortunately, there hasn't been much um, there hasn't been much interest in buying off land in the region, except for a few um, investors who are from based in the Middle East. So it's very interesting to see how Middle Eastern investors are actually coming um, to the region through Indian support. Um, but more importantly, what, what we saw was the eviction of pastoral communities who already had very limited uh, property rights um, in the region and often uh, under the garb of conservation, these peak populations and transhumanists or, um, do not, are, are unable to access um, their uh, land for, grazing land for pastures and something that they very much rely on, not just for livelihood, but also their culture and their lifestyle rely on access to these, um, to these lands and forests. Um, and there are, some, <laughs> ironically, there are a couple, two Indian laws that actually are more progressive than Kashmiri laws have been. One of them is the Indian Forest Act, which provides tribals and people who rely on land uh, and forest uh, more rights, more property rights to, to those resources. Um, but the Indian government has not implemented the Indian Forest Act in Kashmir. And we wonder why, in fact, like these populations are the ones who are uh, the first ones to be dispossessed from land before um, other populations um, um, uh, are. So those are the two points I want to make here. And there's, there's a larger point to be made around um, whether it's capital that was well, the direction of causality here, um, as in um, whether it's capital that determines um, uh, the, the settler colonial practices in Kashmir or is the settler colonial practices that determine uh, how capital is used or capitalism is used, um, neoliberalism is used in the region. And I have a whole th um, um, a hypothesis on that and, and um, another, talk on that, but I'll stop here, Abdullah, and um, let um, you maybe reflect on this on the paper, and then maybe we can take some 
questions and I can expand more on uh, some of the terminologies that I've used today. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Mehrush. I'm glad that you had the opportunity to, to, to kind of go through those last few points because I felt them also very important. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm very, you know, kind of satisfied with that we were able to go through the whole presentation. Um, yeah, I can, I, I can, I can respond to a few things. Um, I've written down quite a few points here um, that kind of like are you know, in some ways, kind of points of connection, in some ways, points of comparison, um, and then just kind of some general kind of unorganized thoughts. Um, and I'm, I'm, I kind of want to start with the, the, the rather interesting fact for me, something that I thought was quite striking was that we, when we start with the, the point of, um, you know, this kind of Kashmir maldevelopment lagging behind narrative um, around the abrogation of Article 370 in 2019, um, this is a similar kind of like moment in time uh, as to when, of course, in in, in the United States, uh, the Trump administration was preparing this, you know, so-called deal of the century, right? Um, the, the, I think it was called officially the Trump peace plan or something like that, um, which also was kind of like predicated on this notion of like economic peace rather than or kind of economic peace before political peace. And so again, kind of like bringing into the question, bringing into the picture, like these notions that also like Palestinians are, you know, in many ways kind of like predisposed to kind of economic maldevelopment or bad development or non-development. Um, there's that famous quote from, I think it was Jared Kushner who said something along, along the lines of like, Palestinians never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Um, and so it's striking to me that these happened at like very similar uh, moments and 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 I from my reading, um, they kind of normalize this discourse of like economic growth or economic rationalism, like some sort of economic, you know, kind of like uh, arbitrary economic rationalism over like the question of human rights or national rights or indigenous rights, um, which in many ways to me was quite striking because I think that these these discourses of kind of like well that's just how the economy works, you know, kind of became very um, hegemonic. In a, in, a, in, a, in a really terrifying way, especially when you pair that with kind of the conversations that were going on with the, um, the, the, the you know, the Bahrain conference that happened as well. Um, and so I think that's, that's a good kind of point from where I can start kind of like building these connections between, you know, your, your presentation and of course the Palestinian context, uh, which I understand is not really my place considering that Subhi um, is not here, but, uh, but I guess I'll I'll uh, I'll try my best to fill that uh, very large void uh, that we're missing uh, with the lack of uh, Subhi, who of course is not able to make it because of a power cut, and that's also a circumstance that we have to put up with, um, you know, when we're trying to kind of have these conversations across Palestine and Kashmir. Um, I I don't know if you want Mehrush, would you like me to continue, or would you like to kind of feedback and then, you know. Uh, I think best that if you continue and then I'll respond sure. maybe at the okay. end, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I was going to say as well, uh, another thing that often struck me, you know, kind of in partially in this, in, in, in the context of your um, presentation, but also um, in previous conversations that I've had kind of working across Palestine and Kashmir is um, kind of how the late Article 370 era, so like the last maybe like, I would say maybe 20 years before the abrogation, in many ways resembled kind of like Oslo era Palestine and it's kind of like political um, structuring in that, you know, there is this there is this kind of like local ruling class, not super representative of, of, of the broader population um, that in many ways like manages, um, you know, kind of like indigenous unrest uh, rather than seeking to represent, uh, you know, the people who, you know, kind of hypothetically or theoretically that they're supposed to represent. Um, but an interesting point of contrast that kind of came up as you were speaking for me was um, the, the, the pace at which kind of like this Article 370 era Kashmiri ruling class, uh, they did not quite embrace, you know, kind of like this turn to capitalism in the same way that the Palestinian Authority did. Um, and this is like a little point of contrast that I thought was really interesting um, and maybe one that we can explore um, you know, uh, as part of this conversation, because I would like to know, um, 
you know, why you think that is the case and and, and also what political uh, purpose that served uh, for, for this ruling class in Kashmir, particularly because I'm thinking about the fact that um, that many of them kind of like in many ways benefited from that protectionism. Um, and so I want to know, in your opinion, like what is the balance between, um, you know, the, the the kind of fortunes that were made in that sense uh, off of this protectionism but in comparison with, you know, kind of like the idea that perhaps it slowed down this colonial process a little bit. Um, one moment. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of just like another interesting thought that I had. Um, there's also this question about land use. So I, I, I had the benefit, of course, of reading um, the paper that this was, um, that this uh, presentation was based on. And of course, uh, you cite in it this ILO report, this International Labor Organization report about um, wages in Kashmir and how one aspect that contributes to, to um, relatively high uh, wages compared to India is uh, the relatively low incidence in Kashmir of landlessness. Um, and so again, coming back to how this kind of like relates to Palestine, like there's this interesting, and of course, like in conversations about settler colonialism, colonialism, we always have to come back to, to land and sovereignty over land, ownership of land, these kind of themes. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm generally also just curious about uh, Kind of like land use and how that has changed uh, post article post the abrogation of Article Three Seventy, um, and of course, like in a broader kind of historical context when it comes to Kashmir, because I know, of course, like land use in Kashmir varies very differently, even from before forty seven to after forty seven, for example. Um, I don't know if that's something that you would you would want you would want to talk about, but I think it could be something interesting to bring up. Um, because of course, uh, that's one of the huge differences, right, between talking about Palestine and Kashmir is, is the question of, of um, sovereignty over land um, and possession of land. Um, but then of course, like I think, and this is where I'm going to end, I still have a few more points, but I'd like to, you know, in the hope that Subhi is able to join us at some stage, come back to these issues after he's spoken about them. Um, the, the question of decentering economy from politics um, in advocacy on Palestine and Kashmir, because of course, like we know, that there are a lot of organizations, agencies out there, individuals who I think perhaps are quite sincere in, in their attempts to kind of do philanthropy and, and fundraising and charity for Palestine and Kashmir. Um, but the, the sense that I get from your presentation, and of course, like this is my sense that I've had for many, many years, is that, uh, you know, as we can see, you know, the, the, the economy, of course, economic matters are important, economic dimensions are important, particularly macroeconomic dimensions. But um, if we're really thinking about, you know, making conversations between Palestine and Kashmir productive and moving forwards on that, um, we kind of need to, in a sense, center the politics because, in, you know, we're not talking about a crisis of, you know, uh, we're, not, we're not essentially talking about a crisis of kind of like long-term poverty, but rather we're talking about, you know, like, a, you know, colonialism and occupation and things that require a lot more than, you know, just kind of like the pumping in of financial resources as a solution. Um, and so, I mean, these are just some 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 points that I've had. Uh, if you'd like to kind of come back on some of them, um, and then hopefully maybe we'll get Subhi back. And if not, I still have more things that we can discuss before we open to Q and A. Yeah, no, thanks so much, Abdullah, for those very detailed um, thoughts. And let me try and respond to them. And if I'm forgetting something, let me know. And um, what we can also do is perhaps after this, maybe take some questions from the audience. I know there's one question there, but if there are other thoughts um, on the presentation so far, or like what I'm gonna say next, um, feel free to put them in, in the chat box. So um, let, let me start with land use and I'll, and I'll go to the other things. But um, I mean, uh, the key thing, and one of the hunch that we have at the moment amongst the academic community is that, um, some of the resilience or some of the re reason that um, we're not that de developed I mean, human development indicators are not as bad as other parts of, of the region or surrounding us is because of uh, the land reforms that uh, took place post um, British leaving um, the region. And they continue till the 1970s, which has meant that a lot of people have some access to, to 
to cultivable land. And that means that people um, have been able to grow their own food and reliance on markets has been very, has not been as, as strong as in a market-based economy would be. So, um, and they're conducting research on that at the moment to find that the reliance on market has been increasing over the last uh, years and, um, but people prefer to um, grow their own food still. And obviously in rural parts, not so much in, in, in urban, but in rural parts of the region and the rural uh, population often thinks about how to get food to the urban, to Sinagar, you know, where people don't necessarily have the same level of access to growing their own food. So that's one thing around like why land is so important to the development, the human development indicators, but also to the economy of the region because people have some sort of means to, to livelihood um, because of this access to land, particularly say for example, in the horticulture sector where six, apparently 60, 70% of the population relies on the Apple value chain in some form or the other to earn livelihoods. So it's previously it's like been passive income coming from the Apple value chain. Um, and the change in land use patterns at the moment basically is that there's, I mean, there's always been, this has always been the case in the last three decades, but there's um, both formal and informal um, um, land grab from the Indian state, particularly from the Indian army because of militarization. And across different meadows that are strategic to the to the Indian state, you'll see um, more and more land extracted or grabbed from, from mil for militaristic reasons. Um, and that has also determined the use of infrastructure, development of infrastructure and investment of infrastructure in the region. And I can um, ex you know, talk about that later on, but one of the main ways of um, the development in the region, but also controlling uh, the economy and the population of Kashmir has been the way the highways and have been constructed and um, in, in the region. So we have one highway that connects the valley to Jammu and therefore from there to the mainland, to mainland India. And similarly, from the other side, from the northern, north, northeastern frontiers, we have one highway that connects us to Ladakh, which is most of the time shut. And uh, the more treacherous highway from in mainland India to Ladakh is open throughout the year. And it, even though it requires much more infrastructure and manpower, or human power to keep it running. Um, or for example, uh, there are only two flights in a week from Srinagar in Kashmir to uh, Leh in Ladakh, whilst there are uh, two flights every day from Leh to Srinagar. So they, and that is because they want tourists to come from Leh to Kashmir, but people, Kashmiri people not going to Leh themselves. Um, and that's the way they, you know, they've uh, constructed infrastructure that, and use land in a way that, um, you know, keeps people from Kashmir isolated from mainland India, but also from their own neighbors being Ladakh and, and Jammu in many ways. Um, so, uh, and since abrogation that this extraction or like grabbing of land has been, um, um, has uh, been accelerated because of the new law that uh, allows the Indian military and the Indian state to take away any land they see as strategic. So they don't even have to prove it in the state, uh, in the court of law to say that why this may be strategic. But if the army, one person in the army said this is strategic, it can be taken away that very day. And that has led to, um, um, cutting of lots of uh, apple orchards and uh, taking away of uh, land of the local population in the region. So that's one thing. And then talking about um, PA versus the elite in Kashmir, yeah, that's something that even I've been thinking about quite a bit. Um, I don't have a full answer. I just have a hunch at the moment, um, which is that the, the elites in Kashmir and the political clients of the Indian state, previously say the Congress go uh, government um, were happy with the status quo of um, Article 370. It gave, they own a lot of the land anyway, um, and that gave uh, them some kind of protection that their own land would not be taken away from them or their financial assets you know, would not be um, uh, impeded on by the Indian state or the Reserve Bank, but India, the in Indian Central Bank. So they had, um, uh, they had that kind of cushion because of Article 370. Now, since the removal, those political clients have been removed from and have been now oppressed and put in jail or, or you know, have uh, been barred from, uh, you know, being in elections or campaigning. Uh, they try to, but they try, they've been basically um, uh, been sidelined by the Indian state and the local population obviously don't necessarily um, uh, link, uh, relate to them, so they don't want to 
um, uh, campaign on their behalf either. But there's a new, our, our field works just as a new bunch of political elites that are now being developed by the, the BJP government. Um, so then they have a new, completely new layer who are very much working the same way um, that you know political clients around the world work where there's a certain elite that benefit from a certain type of like neoliberalism uh, or settler colonialism, that's what's happening here. Um, so that doesn't fully answer, I guess, the question, but I also be there's more comparative work that need, could be done there to learn from these mechanisms of political clients across Palestine and Kashmir and see uh, what perhaps could be done to, you know, um, to resist their own, this encroachment by these political elites. Um, and I think your first point and the last point kind of talks are in a way similar to me. And um, I kind of make this larger point about um, whether the economy is political or not, and from what we find in Kashmir, and I hope, um, not that we didn't know that before, but the economy is political, therefore, the Indian government, um, you know, they, the politics were couched in economic terms, but like, to, to you know, uh, jump on the bandwagon of economic growth and stuff, because that's sellable to the Indian population and to the world, but, um, um, the Indian state itself looks at Kashmiri people being able to earn their own livelihood as as um, uh, act of uh, treason or an act of um, resistance from from the Kashmiri side, because some there is um, the Indian army actually looks at the Apple Valley chain, as I said, which is um, which about 60, 70 percent of the population rely on um, for livelihood in some form or the other. As a, uh, as a terror economy. So it's something that Apple Valley Chain supports the military, the, um, um, the um, um, militants uh, in, in Kashmir. And there may be some truth to it, may not be some truth to it, not everyone. It's not a blanket statement that actually applies in the region. Uh, but um, the point that I was trying to make is that the economy itself is political to the Indian state, which is why they use that as, as, as a a bait um, to to further their uh, not I mean like a, a you know a far um, um, uh, yeah to basically a way to showcase that their their motivation in Kashmir is is just that because of economic reasons. But what I like to actually argue that is it's it's not neoliberalism, it's not capital that drives the settler colonialism in Kashmir. It's it's the settler colonialism, but the politics of their being and their need or their want and desire to take over the region and this population, most importantly, um, is, is the driver. And neoliberal, neoliberal policies or mechanisms are just a tool in their box because religious tourism is not necessarily neoliberal. They're actually pumping in money to destroy the ecology, um, but it's it it furthers their political agenda in the region, right? So that's that kind of resource extraction that I call I still call resource extraction, but not for economic terms, but for political reasons or political agenda or the normalization of Hindu uh, culture, and which it is not. It's not that Hinduism wasn't part of uh, Kashmir, um, but um, uh, that normalization that it's not it's uh, it's not Muslim in the region, but was always Hindu. Um, is um, is is not neoliberalism. It's actually the politics behind it. Okay, I think I'll stop at that point, Abdullah, and let you mm -hmm. uh, continue. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Mehrush. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, since it is the World Cup, I guess we can use the language of football. Um, unfortunately, it seems Subhi is not going to be able to make it um, before we're scheduled to end this conversation. And so Tofi has kindly um, offered to sub in for him. So um, we're raising the board and uh, Subhi's number is up and Tofi's number is also there as well. So please, Tofi, uh, go ahead. Um, as we said, I'm gonna offer, you have 10 minutes. I'll let you know in the chat when you have one minute remaining. Sure. Uh, I just wanted to let our audience know that we tried several times to contact Subhi. There was no response on his WhatsApp. And then actually even trying to call his telephone does not work from uh, Jerusalem numbers because you have separate absurd sort of telecom situ statuses uh, between the OPT and locally and the companies don't, don't really do sharing. Uh, so even though it's ridiculous because they're, you know, 
we're actually in occupied territory here. And if you want to go to the areas that are under supposedly the Palestinian Authority, you're talking 10 minutes away, but you can't uh, always call them. But this is a function of the post Oslo uh, economic policies here. Uh, I, I, I obviously did not, uh, you know, make a uh, plan to make a presentation, although I uh, have a background in the political economy of the OPT. Uh, and listening to Mahrouch speaking, I did want to sort of perhaps give some commentary on aspects of the Palestinian economy and political economy that somehow, uh, let's say, are in conversation with the Kashmir case study, which I came to learn about through hearing Mahrouch, and, uh, but I, I would never claim any kind of expertise on it, and which obviously is the purpose of this conversation series overall. That said, uh, you know, I, I won't give a whole analysis of the Palestinian economy. Uh, I think it, there are several important trends to, to, to point to. Firstly, when we talk about a Palestinian economy today, uh, we also we have to define our terms. Obviously, this is a very important thing because the whole post Osriyadi created the situation where uh, the when someone says Palestine, uh, are they talking about historical understandings of Palestine from the river to the sea? Are they talking about 67 territories, which is West Bank, Gaza, and uh, East Jerusalem? Are they talking about the Palestinian Authority area A's, where the Palestinian Authority has control over? Uh, each one is a huge difference uh, in terms of what it would give you in uh, economic terms or any of those statistics. Uh, but uh, it is worth noting that something called a Palestinian economy was kind of uh, invented, to be frank, uh, as a, a function of the Oslo process. Now, basically, uh, as many of you will know, the Israelis withdrew from uh, the centers of the Palestinian cities uh, and created basically 13 non-contiguous islands where uh, the Palestinians have uh, uh, a Palestinian authority uh, governs in an arrangement known as Area A, okay? And these areas total around 19 or 20 percent of the entire West Bank. Uh, in the Gaza Strip, it was another arrangement, but basically, originally, it was three, 66 percent of the Gaza Strip, uh, and there was a third of the Gaza Strip that was held for the settlements. But of course, the settler population uh, was unilaterally removed after 2005. So uh, basically what we're talking about is non-contiguous territories where the Palestinians have some form of economic governance in them. Now, a, a big part of the Oslo process in, in, was the uh, Oslo II Accords uh, and the Paris Economic Protocols, which basically defined uh, the economic uh, governance regimes of these areas, what the Palestinians could or could not do. Uh, basically, it created, attempted to create a customs envelope where basically the Palestinians would not be able to have any form of strategic advantage. Basically, Israelis, the Israeli state, according to its economic interests, was defining import and export uh, for what goes into the Palestinian Authority areas. Obviously, these are non contiguous areas. Territories that are entirely surrounded by settlements as well as checkpoints, which, uh, similar to the Kashmir case study, entails that it is a low investment economy. And in fact, a probably more important thing to emphasize is that uh, the economic and developmental characterization for the OPT has come from uh, Harvard economist Sarah Roy, who describes it as a state of de development. I heard Mahrouch speaking about maldevelopment, which uh, I was less familiar with. Uh, Roy comes up with this concept of de-development, basically saying that the Israeli state, and not even the market, directly intervenes as an external agent to physically attempt to break up the possibility of economic synergies between uh, Palestinian economic actors uh, and, and geographies, so to speak, to ensure that the OPT and economic, uh, the Palestinian economy basically remains captive and dependent to Israeli prerogatives and Israeli economic interests. Uh, and that means a whole set of different things. Uh, firstly, it means a uh, attempt to ensure that the OPT remains largely 
a deindustrial, unproductive economy. Certainly, uh, a, a secondary feature to it is to ensure that um, uh, Palestinians cannot rely upon agriculture as is, uh, this is obviously a subset of the productive repression on, on productive economic ventures. So uh, take away the land, take away the water, take away rights to land use. So 60% of the land in the OPT is known as Area C. Uh, you can't work or develop on it. Uh, there are, of course, Palestinians in these areas, and this is the majority of the Palestinian land resources, but it is inaccessible from an economic perspective. And uh, let's not forget that even if Palestinians were able to be productive on this land, which they are in some cases, because they're these these this is where the majority, let's say, of the olive uh, olive uh, groves are located, and Palestine has a high olive capacity and high quality and potential. But the fact of the matter is, it's also a competitive uh, geographical thing with local competitors, as well as the, Israel not being interested in any sort of major, you know, surplus being able to be generated by the Palestinian economic actors. So uh, that is basically a repressed economic st status that is enforced through this these policies of de-development, as well as a permanent skills lack. So this comes back to the question of Subway and his telephone. Basically, the OPT is still operating on 3G networks over here. Uh, while Israel is already on 5G and and uh, as many people know will be on you know in the cutting edge of uh, technological development around communication uh, and whatnot but the point here is to emphasize that uh, Israel uh, wants to ensure that the Palestinians have this permanent skills lack and technological gap so that they can't remain competitive at the same time their dependence upon the Israeli economy uh, because basically Israel, exports, put that between quotations, all of its uncompetitive things and dumps them on the OPT. Um, this, uh, you know, uh, Israel wants to make sure that there's this skills gap and that there's also a population that's dependent and that is also uh, buys up their products that are non-competitive. Uh, and that's, that's fundamentally what happens uh, from when Israel controls it. Now, on the Palestinian Authority side of the coin, let's not forget, we have these different areas where uh, Palestinian governance structures have been able to be created, but this their creation was heavily influenced by the World Bank, the International Monetary uh, Fund, and the major donor uh, community, um, which set very important parameters to Palestinian economic activity. If we go back to the Oslo process, there was something actually quite interesting where the Israelis and the internationals tried to promote the peace process as going to be some major, uh, uh, how to say, uh, you know, the peace process was going to usher in a free trade zone and a new neoliberal economic era akin to the NAFTA arrangement between Mexico, uh, Canada, and, and North America. Um, but uh, that, of course, never realized in the end. And uh, in the end, you had entrenched economic interests of all parties, uh, the Israelis, the Egyptians, the Jordanians, and the Palestinians, uh, but obviously quite severe power asymmetries between them. So the Palestinians lacking the sovereignty and the fact that Palestinian dependency on the Israeli economy meant that Palestinian labor was higher in cost in comparison to labor costs in Egypt or Jordan or other theaters like Turkey, meant that Israel, through the Oslo process, was actually able to uh, uh, expand uh, Israeli capital and its industry was able to move out to theaters like Egypt and Jordan and the Far East and get its products out there, while Palestinian, uh, while the, the Palestinian economy kind of remained dependent on what the Israelis wanted, and uh, and their labor costs, because of their dependency on Israel, made them higher and therefore uncompetitive towards these other competitors. So there was something economically flawed about these models, as well as, to say nothing of the 
the very fact that Israel politically was not interested in the Palestinians generating a cohesive, organized, logical economy that could uh, engage with its natural economic partners or reach, uh, have access to markets abroad. That was always to be controlled by Israel. So uh, Israel controlled the economic development of the OPT. But what the Oslo process also did was be able to create a kind of Palestinian economic elite uh, that basically one way or another they hoped would act as a kind of uh, collaborating bureaucratic slash economic slash security class that could, uh, you know, somehow through its own enrichment and power be able to sort of uh, be a compliant political partner to uh, Israeli and Western uh, political interests around the peace process. Now, there's a lot to say about that. I don't want to actually go too much into the Oslo process exactly, but I do want to say that what we did see is uh, the, the Palestinian Authority, and particularly the Fatah Party, was handed the opportunity to monopolize the economic opportunities of the Area A areas within this logic of creating this uh, collaborating economic class. On one level, it could be critiqued for the fact that it created a form of political and economic corruption. On the other hand, some economics have, economists have also noted that this enabled the Palestinian Authority at least to dominate existing economic opportunities and ensure that there were no leakages around this that went to other parties that, for instance, could have a different agenda. And here it's important to, I'll try to end on this because Mahrush also talked about the banks and the existence of a Jammu Kashmir bank or some stage or whatnot. The Palestinians, uh, uh, the introduction of banks into the OPT is relatively new phenomena. There was only two banks in the OPT pre the Oslo era. In fact, really only oh yeah, one in Gaza, uh, the Bank of Palestine, the other, the Cairo Amman Bank, which was set up in 1986. But what we did see after Oslo was the infusion of almost 20, 21 new banks that came into the territory. Uh, the majority of these were Jordanian banks, okay? And what, the reason why I emphasize this, and this relates to some of my research, was is the fact that the international players behind the Oslo process very much saw Oslo as not trying to lead to a political process of Palestinian independence, but actually to impose Jordanian slash American uh, suzerainty slash occupation slash control slash dependency over the Palestinian national movement. And the economic dimension of this had to do with these neoliberal plans that the World Bank came up with and the IMF, but also Jordanian capital moving in from Jordan and regulated from Jordan, controlling Palestinian economic opportunities which would enable them to have political influence over Palestinian political decision-making, somehow keeping the Palestinian Authority and the Fatah movement on side to, to Jordanian Fatah conservative political parameters, and in that way to keep the situation repressed on the ground. So those are some of the main uh, pointers that I think speak to some of what Mahrush has spoken about. I'll leave the rest to Abdullah. Sure, thank you so much, Tofi. Um, I think given that we're starting to kind of come close to the end of the 90 minutes we had scheduled, um, I want to go to questions from the uh, from the uh, from the attendees, if that's all right. Um, and uh, and the question just came in as you were speaking um, about about kind of like you know the Oslo process. And so I'm going to put that to you, Tofi. If that's okay, then we'll go to Dave's question afterwards, which he asked a little bit earlier, but since this one is related, I'll go to it first. So Kolia Abramsky asks, was there ever any discussion during the Oslo process of creating a separate Palestinian currency, or was this never on the agenda? What powers does the Palestinian Monetary Authority have, and what powers does it lack? Well, that's a great question. Thank you, Kolia, for that question. Uh, so, uh, Certainly, the Palestinians envisioned that they would be able to have their own currency out of the Oslo process. But uh, uh, anyone who comes to the OPT will quickly recognize that the Palestinians use the new Israeli shekel, as well as, of course, the dollar and the Jordanian dinar, and that these and that there are many money changer shops around town. 
a, a big reason for this is the very fact that there is uh, Palestinians attempt to diversify their risk and their currencies uh, by, by playing in different currencies, but they are not able to issue a, a, a currency in and of themselves, which is a hugely important factor to point out because basically, if you don't have monetary policy, there's a huge, you know, you, you there's a lot of things that you can't can't do with your economy you know and uh, certainly being dependent upon israeli uh, monetary policies uh, and, mon and 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 fiat currency itself is a huge uh, huge thing so uh, a, a huge problematic so there have been uh, various creative attempts to attempts to creatively understand uh, uh, what can be done there were attempts at some people talked about reissuing the Palestinian pound. Other people talked about some kind of virtual e-currency, you know, when Bitcoin and all these things were were hot. Uh, I mean, they sound interesting on paper, but for serious economists, they're not serious because uh, at the end, I mean, I'm sorry to say serious, but at the end of the day, you know, you need gold. <laughs> you need uh, something convincing behind your currency to make it. Uh, that's, it's not to say that there can't be kinds of local currencies that could be created for certain co cooperative type things. But if, if Palestine is to become something that's more than just an occupied, dependent, de-developed state, it, 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 and to generate a currency that can incur value and be traded on, uh, you know, in larger forums, it, it needs very elementary things like sovereignty. It needs independence, you know, before anyone is really seriously going to recognize a kind of currency. So the interesting thing about the Palestinian Monetary Authority that I'll also mention here, it was something that was created, but it was largely something created not to issue currency, but actually to regulate banks. So all these banks that I just told you actually were very important. So here's some an important side note to, to mention. So everyone remembers there was a second intifada from 2000 to 2005, roughly. After that, you had the World Bank and the IMF and the different donor countries coming in to see what they could do and solve this issue. They worked at that period to create the Palestinian Monetary Authority as well as the Cap Palestinian Capital Markets Authority. So different sectors that they saw as being able to uh, reactivate the Palestinian economy after the, the major... Uh, you know, train wreck, let's say, of the Second Intifada. Uh, so this is where they they pressure the Palestinian, it's not even pressure, to be honest, because they're helping create these institutions that quote unquote regulate these banks, but they're pushing forward the advice that they want, which is that credit be much more liquid, okay? So after you go through a period of extreme economic hardship of the Second Intifada, they open up the, uh, the pipeway of cheap money, and that's why you see all of a sudden, you know, huge rates increases in in the in debt, in indebtedness. And this also, the indebtedness thing was seen as a major way to keep people uh, uh, politically subservient. And in fact, you to some extent, it it was and wasn't successful. But uh, at, on another level, the situation continues to perpetuate and get worse. So you always have a new generation of people who are coming in. Who, who can't marry, who can't find jobs, who are unemployed, who feel the disenfranchisement, and they can't even get bank accounts, you know? So, uh, you know, so even within this sort of primitive neoclassical economic model of like, how do you keep people quiet? You just give them money and a job or something. You know, this is the primitive neoclassical approach to how they want to keep conflict down, uh, you know, just give them money, Yanni, uh, as though people don't have any political questions at their heart you know the thing the ironic thing around here they went for economic peace here but the truth is the millionaires and the billionaires the palestinians who you will find here and there they're not pro israel you know in fact they're they're they're, they're no no more supporter of israel than anyone else and they have not been able to reap the political subservience that they want out of it and that contradictions continue to generate and we see that happening in in the OPT all over the place. And today, Jerusalem, two bombings even this morning. So, yeah, I'm here curious to hear. Oh, well, Mahrush doesn't, there is no, everything, currency is in Jammu Kashmir is all. So it's, yeah, it's Indian currencies. And um, I mean, that all in a way kind of helps us because our trading partner is, I mean, at the moment is primarily India, but also, um, uh, I mean, 
originally the historical traditional routes would be from Central Asia to Pakistan, Afghanistan side, rather than Indian side because of the mountains like divide us really. So currency wise, I mean, for like since the British um, ex exodus or British colonial rule ended in um, in India, uh, we've always had Indian currency in the region. But the bank in itself was a big thing. And like JK Bank is such a big um, capitalistic, like um, neoliberal center in itself, because it's not just prevalent in Jammu Kashmir, it's also prevalent in India. And um, the Indian R RBI, it's Reserve Bank of India, the Indian Central Bank would never really like control it um, because um, of the way it used to run. And now they've managed to get some, you know, managed zero control over it because in the Jammu Kashmir state used to order. So it was actually like some way quasi-private, quasi-public in some format, you know, like because the elites used to run it, but the elites relied on the smallholder and the middle income Households to to run the bank itself, and therefore gave a lot of credit to people and relied on social relationships to get the the, the loans back and um, and stuff. So anyway, that's a complete another conversation, which is kind of picking up on some some of the points that you said around like you know how the Israeli economy itself kind of uh, benefits from the post Oslo economy, and I kind of is this is work in progress, but I quickly wanted to like share my screen. To, to kind of talk about this graph. I don't know if you can see it. Um, can you see my graph? I see it, yes. It's very clearly very old school, very handwritten on a piece of paper, but I kind of wanted to get some feedback from you because we've been kind of talking about these stages of the development and um, where the settler uh, economy extracts from the, colon the occupied economy. So just to me, on the y-axis over here, I have economic growth. On the x-axis, I have time as time goes. And this um, this curve is the settler economy, and this um, uh, curve, this this one that's going down here, is the occupied economy. So the way my team and I are kind of um, theorizing this is that there are different stages of de-development depending on where the settler economy, how entrenched the settler economy is on the occupied economy. And where we think what Kashmir is at the moment is somewhere around here, where India cannot fully extract economic value from the region, but is continuing to depress it in terms of like redu reducing economic growth in the region. And at some point, it will go up here where they'll start extracting, you know, economic value from from Kashmiri economy. Whilst that, whilst this is happening simultaneously, it's the economic growth of like the occupied spaces that go down like slowly, you know, and then they become flat at some point where it, there'll be no growth at all, or they'll only just be like worse and worse uh, living conditions, living standards. So we think that obviously Palestine is somewhere around here where the Israeli economy does extract value from it. So there are different stages of development, which is why this difference between how the PA reacts, acts, and reacts, and how the elite in Kashmir react, and how the, the Israeli state reacts versus the, like the Indian state reacts to the different things. At the moment, the Indian state is just pumping in value into the into embedding itself into the Kashmir economy, to creating that dependency. So somewhere here will be some kind of level of dependency relationship between the settler and the occupied. I see like various facial expressions. I'm gonna stop here just to invite some feedback, not just from Abdullah Yasser and Tofik, but maybe perhaps also from, from the audience. Yeah, if I might just add to that a little bit, or at least speak to the Palestinian side of it. Um, you know, it, I, from what I'm hearing from you, Mehrush, the, the extraction of value uh, from Kashmir, Jammu Kashmir itself is, uh, you know, as of course, there are big geostrategic things going on, but there's also a lot of attempt to do this extraction going on. I, I don't want to discount that Israel's extract, extractive policies vis-a-vis -vis the OPT. And let's not forget that uh, ever since the Oslo process started, like $30 billion of foreign aid has come into the OPT with estimates that 70 cents to every dollar that comes in end up in the Israeli pockets. So uh, because of this, uh, you know, overbearing uh, command over the Palestinian economy. Uh, moreover, it's just worth noting, even in the Oslo process, for certain staple goods like concrete or steel or even gas and oil, there was effort. The, the Oslo Accords did make provisions to allow the 
Palestinian Authority to import these from Jordan or from Egypt, where they're much cheaper than the Israelis. But this is exactly how Israel used the uh, closure and checkpoint system that it erected. Of course, it has five, 600 different checkpoints around. And basically what it would do is say, well, if you want to bring in this Egyptian concrete into uh, to build all these buildings that you want to build in, in Ramallah, we have to make sure that we can check each bag and maybe it has weapons in them or explosives in them. By doing this and creating that, uh, you know, those questions, it enabled Israel to actually to tip the economic favoritism towards its suppliers uh, in all these things. And, and, and in so doing, create, creating this intermediary class of mm -hmm. businessmen who, uh, you know, are, work, are playing on both sides. And in fact, the whole characteristic of the Palestinian economy has a lot of these features with the Palestinian Authority actually being central to it, but at least they're supposedly somewhat accountable politically to the Palestinian, larger Palestinian political questions. Um, it, so the only thing that I wanted to mention about the de-development map that you've got here is that, yeah, the, I mean, it's taken uh, a long, the, Israel's primary interests around taking these areas are, I mean, there's, there's, there's many, we shouldn't overlook them or minimize them. The, although the economic is lower in, lower in the, in the, in the chain, shall we say, you know, Israel w wanted and needed uh, to, to control the, the West Bank. There were plans for it before 1967. Uh, it's important to say, you know, they wanted the hilltops, all the areas in the West Bank were the were the historical ideological areas for Zionism. Israel pre-67 controlled the coastal strip, none of which is even mentioned in the Bible. So the whole biblical narrative that they were trying to push about their Jewish return to Palestine and blah, 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 that those questions, uh, you know, were did it, did it make sense in a pre-67 Israel, let alone the fact that in the tightest locations where the West Bank juts into juts westward, it creates, you know, the coastal plain is only 13 or 15 kilometers wide. So the Israelis strategically didn't like this for the, the narrowness of pre-67 Israel. Of course, the mountaintops that overlook the coastal plain, the water reserves, the major aquifers which are located there. There are, of course, as well, important quarries, important agricultural land, as well as, of course, the major strategic uh, interest, which uh, uh, is the the Jordan Valley, which is a huge economic zone in terms of being able to produce three different crops a year mm. there, some of the most fertile land. But also, if you control the mountain ridge that overlooks the Jordan Valley, you basically, they call it in military terms, the largest tank trench in the world, because any army coming from the east would have to pass through this big Jordan Valley over there. So, uh, but the economic comes up later, you know, in terms of their needs. Uh, they're, but they're doing all of these things. And not just that, at a certain point, something that's also worth pointing out is that uh, at a certain point, you know, the internationals were have basically been tolerating this entire situation of, you know, even... Israel destroyed the whole peace process kind of notion that it was something going to lead towards a negotiated, uh, amicable solution between people. And they went towards their interpretation of it. That had huge economic and political repercussions on the OPT, et cetera. But it also meant a lot of financial things, right? That, so, so funders have been basically su uh, subsidizing an unproductive, de-developed Palestinian economy that relies upon hidden unemployment, <laughs> you know, this kind of corrupt smuggling economies that, or, or dominance of, of, of these positions of power. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and they tolerate, even though all their paperwork talks about, you know, encouraging open market economies and, and, and whatnot. And uh, I kind of lost my train of thought, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's a pretty okay. absurd situation that's that's arisen around here yeah we'll we'll if, if if you find that train of thought it would be wonderful to, to kind of write it to the end but um i noticed that we're running short on time and so i would really like us to be able to address these last couple of questions um if we can so the first question was asked by dave chapel um and that is is there already or is there scope for a jammu and kashmir boycott divestment and sanctions campaign similar to that for Palestine, that would target those responsible or complicit 
in JNK's ongoing dispossession and oppression. And the second question I'm just going to ask them together, even though they're a little bit distant, is um, it would be great, this question's from Babur Hussain, it would be great if you could talk about how local elite class benefits from de-development policies. Um, and so I'll let either of you take either of those questions, whatever order you want. Um, if there are any more questions, please do type them into the Q&A box. We'll try our best to get to them um, before time is up. So uh, who would like to go first? Maybe I'll go for the first one because there's been this uh, post of this question a while ago. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, the answer is yes and no in a way. Um, and the reason I say that is that, I mean, most like big Indian conglomerates like kind of benefit from what, what is happening in Kashmir and very much like tied with the Indian state, particularly, you know, the reliance on the Adanis and stuff because of, uh, they provide telecom and other essential services in the region. So there's a whole bunch of them, but um, it's, and the reason I say no is, so yes is that part of it, but the no part of it is that how the success of that campaign kind of relies on how the West actually sees this ties with economic ties with, with India at the moment. And um, personally, personally, this is my opinion, but that, that, that activism effort may be better placed in a couple of other campaigns, which are more targeted towards the, the military elite of India that um, are based uh, abroad. So maybe the Magnitsky law or something like that, but B BDS, yes. But in, short, in short, the answer is BDS, yes, but um, um, we may have to be slightly um, um, strategic about what kind of campaign that would mean because it's, it's uh, internationally, um, the Indian um, Indian state and the Indian um, uh, companies kind of are in a favorable position right now with with the West and the rest, even not just the West, the rest of rest of the world, really, including you know the the uh, the Middle Eastern governments at the moment, which are India's a darling of like all the Middle Eastern governments at the moment. Um, so that's that's like a quick response to. To that question, and I'll let maybe Tofi answer the second question by Barbara about um, local elites. Yeah, I mean, it builds off of what I was saying. Like the de-developed economy means they're not interested. The donors and the Israelis are not interested in uh, uh, in supporting productive economic uh, enterprises. Actually, now I remember what I was going to say before. Uh, donors put up $30 billion to, to float this corrupt, rotten situation that basically has emerged of this de-developed economy. But then when the Arab Spring and all these protests started happening the past 10 years, they realized that there were other theaters that they needed to give money towards, and they also wanted to establish Fortress Europe or whatnot. So they, interestingly enough, came out with reports talking about what the economic advantages would be if Palestinians had access to Area C. Because they looked in their own pockets, said that, you know, we, we don't have any extra money, but maybe the Palestinians can make some own money if they start using Area C, which is the land that was supposed to be used for the Palestinian state. And they came out and they said, they did whole studies that said it would add an additional $1.5 billion to the economy, which would be a huge, huge add to the Palestinian econ economy. But uh, it didn't go anywhere, basically. But... Uh, it speaks to a little bit of the rottenness of the situation, how 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 the donors aren't even happy with it at this stage, uh, because it's not a conflict uh, resolution scenario, but a conflict management one that is now being leveraged to turn use economic and and political and quote unquote security tools to to liquidate the struggle. And one of the str dimensions of this at the frontiers is it is the attempt on the economic. So the question that Babur was asking is how local economic actors benefit from these deep development policies. So if you're not going to have productive investment uh, factories and you're not going to allow uh, agriculture as also a productive sphere to emerge, what emerges? It's consumption. It's uh, the entirety and, and, and the services and trade and, uh, and uh, as well as like retail holding uh, these kinds of people. There's, there's a lot of stuff that goes on here like, um, like hoarding. Of, uh, of 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 uh, how do you say it? Uh, working on leveraging, uh, you know the you know the, you ha kind of basically have monopolies that are controlling import export going on here, you know, which enables them to uh, take advantage of these unfair economic market quote unquote 
conditions. And uh, so the Palestinian Authority was basically in, a, established the large holding structures, the, ho the holding companies actually, that enabled the major import, uh, not quite export, but the import uh, of basic supplies. So cement, fuel, uh, all the, uh, and they became also conglomerates of import related to, uh, how to say, Western corporate interests and their Arab dimension. So, uh, you know, like Unilever or whatever, like which has everything from Pringles to diapers or something like that. That is all imported by different conglomerates of uh, monopoly structures, basically, that have these licenses to control these import exports. And then they, they, they dominate and then they distribute to the local market. And the, 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 the donors help them also create a customs authority to try and enforce their local monopolistic position, positioning. Uh, at the end of the day, it, like I said, though, it's, it's, it's all based around consumption. So there's nothing, you know, that's good if you're a trader if you, if you, or if you control retail somehow or if you have a bunch of trucks or, you know, that kind of thing. But in the end of the day, it's just, uh, you know, you have much more systemic structural issues that are problematic that, that 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 are incurring and that are economic that are not going to be able to manage uh, you know long term uh, unemployment issues i mean think about female labor uh, engagement in the palestinian labor uh, participation it's like between 12 and 15% in, in in let's say in places like the gaza strip i mean in 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 the west in the gaza strip itself it's like 80% maybe maybe i don't want to exaggerate that but it's at least 60% of college graduates don't even have a job, you know. So, uh, you know, you have serious systemic problems, uh, economic problems that that these small solutions that are based upon quick money for an elite or, or whether Israeli or Palestinian are not going to be able to solve. And when things get hot, they all disappear and they run. In fact, the interesting thing about the one thing that I came out with in my own study was that investment actually goes only into areas that are productive, not productive, profitable in situations of either war or peace. <laughs> so if you control aluminum and, and, and glass and all those imports or tobacco or whatever, it's like if the Israelis blow up a house, all right, you're going to make some money. If they don't, there's going to be new construction around it. But we're, but we're still going to make money, you know, but nobody's taking the risk. You know, uh, and nobody's creating stuff that will will generate income or that are creating new partnerships outside. It's just deepening the situation of dependency and de-development. Uh, so I hope those. You know, you, you were talking. the th The interesting thing about Babur's question is that the economic elites. Th there was this expectation that the economic elites would be used as a way to to pressure political elites to to keep the investments the political situation calm don't let it get out of their control so that they could continue to accrue but the truth is because investment was so risky and capital is so, such a coward in a place like the opt they only went into places where it was profitable for war and peace whether it's fighting or not fighting and uh, and uh, so uh, there was no political return in terms, it was just corruption, <laughs> you know, uh, and and in fact, not just corruption, but you have the situation like with the telephone companies where they created monopolistic positioning for, uh, there was a Palestinian elite who was brought in to set up the, the Palestinian telephone company and the, the, the mobile operator company. They had a monopoly for the first 10, 15 years of their existence. And if, in fact, after that, they they still had monopoly over different parts of telephony. But the point is, I mean, these guys were charging the highest rates in the world and giving the worst services in the world. And that was documented across the board. Uh, uh, they were giving part of their money to Palestinian Authority, but at that same day, they were mo mostly making the money themselves. And they were bribing the people who were supposed to be regulating them in the Palestinian Authority. Okay, and, and, and not just that, then the Palestinian Authority, Tony Blair actually came around to the occupied territories, tried to set up a competitive, telephone company to just to the existing one 
with Qatari money and Kuwaiti money that was to set up the Uridu telephone company competition, the Wataniya uh, telephone company here. And it came out that the original Palestinian company who controlled the telephone was bribing the Israelis to stop the import of the equipment for the competition. So it speaks to this sort of corrupt atmosphere, uh, you know, that, that exists that's, you know, that uh, is, is tolerated around here and you can't really do anything about it. So, uh, I, well, actually forget that last part of that, but it gives you a sense of the character of the of this sort of uh, extreme deformations of, uh, of ec economic activity that exists under occupation and these conditions. All right, uh, Mehrush, do you want to add anything to that? Nope, okay. Thank you very much to uh, Mehrush and Tofi and uh, Emma and uh, and everyone, I guess, and the CBRL, the Kenyan Institute. Um, I think we're out of time. And I mean, there are still so many more questions and so many more kind of like avenues through which this conversation can go. I mean, I still have like another like page of notes based on the conversations that we've been having and my note taking capacity has been very limited throughout so that's quite a lot um would anyone else like to 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 wrap up this event are there any other events upcoming that you would sure get, Emma, get, take it away go ahead yes well thank you so much abdullah for stepping in and chairing such a, a brilliant event thank you so much Meruk, uh, Merush, sorry and uh, as well as tafik obviously for jumping in last minute and all my wishes to zobi i uh, hope He's okay with his uh, with the power cut and what is going on where he is. So thank you everyone for coming and thanks for brilliant questions. Uh, I truly really enjoyed this panel. I learned a lot um, and I hope you all did too. So our next session is, as I said at the start, on the 13th of December. And we have the pleasure to have um, Ala El Azeh from Birzeit University in Shamalik who is a scholar and author of the book, Muslim Women, Agency, Resistance and Politics in Kashmir, and Virinder Kalara from University of Warwick. And they will uh, talk on the theme of popular resistance movements. So it is 13th of December. So just keep an eye on, on our website, kashmirpalestinescholars.org, uh, where we will uh, open up the registration link to that event close to the time. And so thank you so much. And um, the recordings will be available on uh, the link that's in the chat. And uh, so thank you and enjoy the rest of the evening, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, and be patient with us with getting the last, uh, the first two events uh, up online on our website. We're working on it where all the, all the Palestine Kashmir conversations will be featured. So thank you, everybody. And thank you for going with the flow as well. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care.